and just want to make sure, can everybody see the screen okay? It says, uh, call it what it is, anti-blackness? Yes. Yes. Cool. So what we're going to, uh, the way that we're going to do this, the way that we, we do with a lot of our, our reading groups of Black Studies is we read out loud and we pause every paragraph or so to, to have a discussion. But what we're going to do today is before we start reading is we're going to give a, a brief background about things that we've, a framework that we've been using uh, as we've been studying. And um, so that framework is going to be talking about the modern world, the world of 1492. And it'll just be for about 10 minutes before we start reading and that framework we think can really help understand what the art help understand what the article is saying um and yeah and tim has put in the chat if y'all can keep an eye on the chat tim has suggested that if you do speak up and you you do have a contribution if maybe that's when you can introduce yourself so we don't do the introductions in the beginning uh all right so well, uh, we're, we're going to read this article together, and it's, uh, it came out in the New York Times last week. It's called Call It What It Is, Anti-Blackness. And so it's going to talk about the difference between calling it racism and calling it anti-blackness, but really introducing people for many, many people for the very first time this term, anti-blackness. So uh, before we get into that, we're going to uh, talk about uh, a framework that we've been using, as I mentioned, um, and it is this framework here, the world of 1492. Now, this is uh, an invitation. When you when we read about um, anti-blackness, the stuff on anti-blackness, that comes from a really, really deep tradition called the Black Radical Tradition. It has been its thought, its philosophy, its movement that has come from uh, Black people, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, but also in the Eastern Hemisphere, which questions the entire world. And it's not something that we are really encouraged to do when we go to school. We're not encouraged to question the world. We're encouraged to just accept it as natural and then move from there. But what the Black radical tradition brings us is the questioning of the entire world. And it's incredibly rich. And it's come from scholars, but it's also come from, from enslaved people, people who couldn't read, uh, people who didn't have formal education, were contri have contributed to a lot of this thought. And the questioning is of the entire world. And what they mean by the entire world, they mean the world, the modern world that we live in right now, the, the globalized world since 1492. And something that is very, very um, common about this world, and this may sound familiar, is that there is an idea that Europe traditionally has been superior to non-Europe. Now, this is the history of when the uh, Europeans came to this, con to this continent and uh, the wars of conquest and the voyages of so-called so discovery they ended up coming across uh, these new lands and colonized these new lands. And Europe at the time wasn't really an entity. It's obviously a geography. There, it was very, very diverse. It was also warring. It was in a situation of war, uh, of competition within. Uh, and a way that they were able to create uh, a space that was relatively peaceful is by exporting out their war outside of Europe. So they said, well, if y'all want to go to war, don't do it here, go do it outside. And so then the idea of the creation of this space called non-Europe was supposed to be then for this new creation of Europe as a space of war. Europe was creating its uh, international law, which of course there was war within Europe, but the idea is that there's laws of war. There's like a way that you need to comport yourself in a civilized manner. Uh, but none of those laws applied to non-Europe and by non-Europe, of course, Africa, the Americas and uh, Asia in general. And so this was a way that modern Europe was able to create itself by 
uh, not only exporting out its violence to non-Europe, but also in that violence, uh, colonizing, extracting, raping, of course, pillaging, destroying other worlds that existed in, uh, in the, in, in the, in the, on the planet. And so the idea of the world isn't like the, the physical uh, geographic map. The idea of the world is like values, ethics, institutions, the way like philo philosophies, spiritualities, the ways that um, different societies understand the universe, for example. So in order to create Europe, this idea of non-Europe had to be created. And again, it's not just an idea. It was a fact in uh, the real world. And this ends up going on kind of un uh, uninterrupted until, of course, there are, there's resistance movements throughout the world, throughout the, th throughout the non-European world, anti-colonial resistance movements. And eventually it gets to the point where the whole idea of colonialism ends up getting a bad rap. And not only that, colonialism's war, the wars that were supposed to be only in non-Europe end up boomeranging back into Europe with the Nazi Holocaust in particular. With World War II, Europe ends up destroying itself uh, as it had created itself under colonialism. And so uh, what that ends up doing is it ends up creating this idea that, okay, so the globe won't be divided neatly into Europe of peace and non-Europe of war. What we need now is a universal human uh, equality. Everybody has human rights. Everybody is equal. This was the 20th century, this was the United Nations, this was, right, this was after World War II. And so you get this idea of universal human equality, and now what's centered is the idea of the human. But what ended up happening is that there's something about the dominant Western or European philosophy or worldview that every time it encounters difference, it needs to rank it as either superior or inferior. So there's a reason why this human realm up here is at the top and this non-human is at the bottom. The human, in a world that is centered with the human, the human is understood to be the maker of the universe of the world. And so in order to even have this idea of a human for European thought, for Western thought, immediately you needed to have so what is the difference then? What is the what is the human? Well, the human is is uh, it, uh, is not the non-human. Uh, so its identity ends up being created in negation to something else. And so then this is when we get the um, today we have the idea, for example, of the terrorist. And so then if you dehumanize anyone, then immediately you have some kind of legitimacy to go to war with them. This is also Mother Earth under capitalism. Capitalism is centered on the human, which is its own specific idea of what the human is. It's like the waged worker, for example, uh, the civilized person. And uh, you can do anything, you can produce anything under capitalism by destroying Mother Earth because the whole idea is, of course, to extract and make profit. So then there's a superiority to the human and an inferiority to the non-human. And this continued on in the context of uh, the United States and beyond uh, these uh, old slave owning societies that there were some humans that were more humans than others, even if they were all supposed to have some kind of equality. Now, I wanna pause there just to check in and see if there are, are any questions or any doubts. But again, you can put that in the chat. Uh, and I don't, see, I don't see anything there, but like Sarah had suggested, please put an asterisk by your name if you have, if you have a question, and then we can call on you. I'll move on to this next slide. If you notice here, 
there, there are these arrows and these arrows represent a probably the most dominant response to resistance to the, uh, by those who have been uh, dehumanized. And that idea is to go from below from the, from the inferior position and go up to the superior position. So that idea is assimilation. And we hear this a lot with uh, immigrants, with migrants. Uh, in the United States, for example, uh, Poles, Irish, Jews, Italians were considered inferior to uh, Europeans from Britain, for example, or Germany. And uh, in order for them to um, be accepted, uh, as we know, to become white, they, 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 they wanted to go up and be accepted. But in order to do that, these arrows, what they actually are is making your life while maintaining this foundation of inferiority under your feet. So in that case, they needed to be uh, against black people, remove themselves from black struggle, uh, no longer live near black people, not intermarry, of course. And so then assimilation, what it does is it continues to keep this division and it makes it so that just some can go up to the top to the superiority position. But they do that, of course, by maintaining others as their inferiors. So this is where you start getting, for example, the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant, even like the good black person versus the bad black person. And the thing is that you can't ever really be at the very top. There's always like inter rivalry within your own group. So even white people, that's why we hear this term or we have this term called white trash. They're not, they're in competition over who's whiter than the other. So the entire framework, like the way that the modern world works in a modern Western world is through this logic. It's a philosophy that in order to be in the world, you need to be uh, superior than somebody else, that that's the struggle. So it doesn't know how to respect difference. It only knows uh, how to compete, uh, destroy difference, or maybe absorb it. <clears throat> And I mention absorb it because I do a lot of work myself with Palestine. And after World War II, Jews, um, with the Zionist movement, the idea that Israel should, uh, that Jews should have a nation state, they, uh, that's an assimilationist project that went up to the realm of the human, whereas Jews had been dehumanized, of course, under World War II and before then. And in order to be accepted in this world, they needed to create their non-human. And this is where Palestinians are um, because you need to differentiate yourself to show that you're better than somebody else. And so again, I mentioned that this is a logic. It's superiority, inferiority. Superiority, those who are in the position of superiority are said to be more deserving of peace and those in the position of inferiority said to be deserving of war. Also notions of freedom. In the United States, the idea of freedom could only exist through slavery. And we often hear, for example, that the founding fathers had slaves, but we're taught that that's just kind of like, you know, an, um, Unfor an unfortunate uh, side note, except that in order for the founding fathers to even conceive of the idea of freedom, again, coming from the Western society that they came from, they needed to have it be constructed on top of its negative, which was slavery. So of course, that's a, a conceptually, that's how they created this idea of freedom, but also in the world, in their practice, in order, to be considered a free person, you needed to be able to vote, for example, and not sell your vote, not be held hostage, uh, not gamble away your vote, uh, not owe anyone anything for your vote or for any political decision that you were making. And in order for that to be almost guaranteed, 
you needed to then be materially well off. And this is the role that slavery then had in uh, these founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, for example. He was able to be, um, he was able to, he was able to uh, be a quote unquote free person because he was materially well off. So the American idea of freedom necessarily requires slavery in order for it to make any sense or to come into being. Uh, this has also been mapped on to whiteness and uh, blackness. So the idea of Europe and non-Europe uses phenotype, skin color, and the ways that we look externally to mark us. So your uh, uh, European descendants decided that they would call themselves white and that they would call Africans black. And that would be an easy way to mark who was the superior and who was the inferior, who was the free and who was the enslaved. So again, this is a logic and it has these patterns. So then with assimilation being the situation that we're in right now, if you read the black radical tradition, there is an enormous fierce critique of who they call the black misleadership class. It's the way that this world has been able to incorporate some from the inferior position, how we talked about earlier with, with Jews and Zionism in order to uh, make it seem as if it has fixed race, it has, it, it, it is no, it has uh, redeemed itself, it's repented. And it, and it also does that uh, very effectively to confuse us. So for example, a black president, um, in a lot of ways, this can be very seductive, having a black president at the top uh, continue to leave uh, a, the vast majority of black people at the bottom. And so, for example, Barack Obama, he was able to get a lot of white support because he was able to be differentiated from as the good black person versus the bad black person. And so what you also get from the black radical tradition, notice that there's this red circle. The red circle around this entire framework is the the world the modern world and so what they say is uh, this assimilation stuff is not doing anything other than perpetuating this injustice this crime so the whole thing needs to be dismantled and that's why that red circle is there to so conceptually get us to understand that this is a unity Peace versus war, whiteness versus blackness, superiority versus inferiority. It's a unity. They work together. So that whole thing needs to be dismantled and new relationships need to be created. We need to treat each other completely differently from this logic. And so there's a lot of um, really beautiful history of uh, the escape. See this uh, yellow arrow here, leaving. Um, and, and leaving from, of course, the realm of blackness, not leaving from the realm of whiteness. So the idea is that in order to dismantle this whole thing, those who are privileged need to come down to the, the ones that are most mistreated and organize and escape. I used to call this exit, but escape is what uh, a lot of the black radical tradition um, uses because it acknowledges that everybody is forced into these positions. Uh, you can't just, you know, exit just because you want to leave it. Because if you try to leave it, you're going to get try you're going to get pulled back. So it, that's where there's going to, that's where the, the, the big battle is when you want to escape this entire thing is that it wants to pull you back. Because for example, if whiteness, if we understand like the master versus the slave, the master is nothing without the slave. So if the slave escapes, then the master is master of nothing. So the master needs that foundation of the, if it's inferior in order to even exist. So here, uh, very, very crucial. This is an example of 
of those fugitives, those who have escaped. If you've ever heard of the Maroons, and even in the United States, there are Maroons. Uh, Jamaica's got a really rich history of Maroons. These are escaped slaves uh, or escaped enslaved people and who many times uh, would get together with Native Americans and even Europeans who also didn't want anything to do with the modern world. And they would create whole new societies where, they, of course, they had to like, really, it really means creating whole new societies. You have to figure out how you're going to eat, how you're going to get water, how you're going to have shelter, how you're going to have security, how you're going to have creative expression, how you're going to have councils of justice, how you're going to treat each other, education, all of that. Uh, so there's a, a really, really rich history within the Black radical tradition that talks about escape. If you read any Black uh, prison literature, there's a lot of discussion about the escape as well. Uh, there is a question from Jabbar in the chat. Uh, it says, I was under the impression white trash referred to poor hillbillies living outside the guise of capitalism. And that's a really great question because we think about the outside. Um, a lot of poor white people have a difficult time uh, talking about black, black struggle, for example, that doesn't also talk about white struggle or that calls white poor white people racist because they'll say, well, you don't know my struggle. I don't, I, you know, we don't have a lot of money. You know, we've had to all of this. Uh, and what has happened with that traditionally is that poor whites and poor blacks in a lot of ways have been, uh, it's been, you, you would think that they would get together. You would think that they would get together because their material conditions are so similar that they would want to take capitalism down and create a whole other world. What, it, what has ended up happening though is that uh, and the black, the black radical tradition talks about this, uh, and also later whiteness studies scholars started talking about it, is that even though there are poor white people and poor black people, there's a psychological wage, even if it's not monetary, there's a psychological wage to being white. So even if you're poor and white, at least you're not black. And this is also sadly what a lot of people of color, and this is why it's important to make the distinction between black and people of color. People of color, uh, even though we're inferior, inferiorized a lot, uh, made inferior a lot, uh, this world gives us a little bit more tools, at least one more tool, to be able to uh, try to survive in it. And that one tool is that we're not black. And again, if you can't be white, then at least don't be black. And when we accept that, we're moving into that assimilation and maintaining the world. And so this is when uh, you'll see in the literature, if you read more about anti-blackness, you'll, you'll read a lot about how anti-blackness exists within people of color communities, with Asian communities, there's a lot of literature with that. Uh, and, and, and even among black people, to try to be the good black person versus the bad black person. So ex existing outside of capitalism, um, existing outside of capitalism would not be possible for poor white people unless they rejected their white privilege. And the only way to really do that is to create a whole other society uh, where they don't need this one because um, they can still get privilege even if they don't ask for it. They need to actively reject it um, because this society will give you privilege uh, even if you don't deserve, if, you, if you've not earned it, if you, if you don't even want it. There needs to be an active rejection of it. And Tim has in the, in the chat that uh, from what he has studied, a lot of people labeled quote unquote white trash are still in the system. The term quote unquote mountain people might be more outside or on the edges of capitalism. And then he has a link to a Smithsonian article about it. And, and he writes, mountain people have a lot more autonomy than people labeled 
white trash. And that seems to make more sense. Yeah, like uh, jiving with what I just mentioned about you need to create a whole other society where of autonomy, where, where your community can take care of or basically creates a whole other world. That way you don't need the privilege that is afforded to you by the dominant world. Okay, so that's the end of that presentation. And now we can move on to the article. Um, but there are some questions. Uh, Lisette, if you want to uh, go ahead. Um, I was just kind of wondering what kind of changes you've made to the presentation since it was created. Um, like you mentioned, exit versus escape. And I heard you say, like, enslaved versus slave. Um, like, like what changes have you made to the presentation and what like differences in concept have, have been to seen? to which presentation to this presentation yeah is your question more about the use of either slave or enslaved no it's just like wondering how the presentation or how your mind has changed since you've made the presentation uh I don't, well, when would, when would be the, my question would be like, when would be the beginning of it? Um, when did you create the Oh, this one about 30 minutes ago. Oh, no, I mean, like, I've seen this presentation before uh -huh. uh, at, at the lab, so. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, one way that had been uh, very common when we talked about this was that the, Instead of the top and the bottom, the above and the below, they would be side by side. Um, but in recent, and probably the last uh, six months or maybe the last year, um, it, I found it to be more conceptually helpful to uh, talk about how, the t how whiteness thinks that it's superior and black and that it thinks blackness is inferior by putting one on the top and one on the bottom. That's a big chain. Slave and enslaved, there's a whole debate that I haven't taken a position on yet on whether do you say slave, do you say enslaved people? Um, and we can talk about that later because I don't want this to be about me. Uh, but the debate about that is that you know, enslaved people, uh, points to how this is something that's happening to people rather than how they actually are. Uh, but there's this whole really, really rich debate on what's called ontology, on how worlds create ontologies, meaning that they create uh, uh, ideas of, of what one is, of what things are, of what makes a thing a thing, and that under capital, under the modern world, the idea has been created that uh, that black people are slaves, uh, the figure of the slave. And it's not to say that that's natural. Again, it's to say that capitalism has decided that in the modern world has decided that. Is there anything else? All right, cool. So uh, we'll move on to reading the article. And here we can take, um, volunteers of whoever wants to read a paragraph, um, please put a star. Uh, and of course, we wanna do a progressive stack. So if we can get our black compas or black homies to, um, uh, to, to feel more welcome and then uh, white folks to step back a bit. Um, uh, the way that we usually read is, um, so, uh, on our on on Instagram and social media, you'll find like this panel uh, that these set these sets of uh, panels for this article that just came out. Um, and to just show it here, um, what we'll do though, and there are nine of them. What we'll do is um, we'll read the screenshots of the actual article, which is here, and then take a pause. Um, after each slide, if that works for folks. Uh, does anybody want to volunteer to um, read out loud, beginning with the title, the subtitle, the author's name? Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Uh, opinion, call it what it is, anti-blackness. 
when, pe when black people are killed by the police, racism isn't the right word by Kihana Mariah Ross. Dr. Ross is a professor of African-American studies, uh, written June 4th, 2020. Uh, it says that the, ter the word racism is everywhere. It is used to explain all things that cause African-American suffering and death, inadequate access to healthcare, food, housing and jobs, or a police bullet, baton or knee. But racism fails to fully capture what black people in this country are facing. The right term is anti-blackness. And we'll pause there to see if there are any thoughts or any questions. And if not, we can move on. Uh, does anybody wanna, anybody else want to read? If not, I think Sarah was doing a great job, but <laughs> if, if anyone feels called. Maybe continue, Sarah, that's okay. Oh, sure, sure. To be clear, racism isn't a meaningless term, but it's a catch-all that can encapsulate anything from black people being denied fair access to mortgage loans, the Asian students being burdened with a model minority label. It's not specific. Many Americans awakened by watching footage of Derek Chavon killing George Floyd by kneeling on his neck are grappling with why we live in a world in which black death, black death loops in a tragic screenplay, scored with the wails of childless mothers and the entitled indifference of our murderers. And an understanding of anti-blackness is the only place to start. Are there any thoughts on this? Any any questions? Are there any terms that anyone might have a question about here uh, to clarify? Okay. There's a term right here called model minority. And um, in case folks haven't heard this term, this idea is usually applied to Asian people. The idea being that um, Asian people are minorities in the United States, but they're in a highly formally educated and more uh, up, uh, higher up on the economic social ladder and uh, well-behaved, relatively well-behaved is the idea of what the dominant society says. And so the label that they've been given is model minority, which one erases a lot of the radical struggle that they were that they were traditionally involved in, especially in the 60s and 70s. And before then, uh, with internment camps, for example, um, that history is erased. And it also makes it so that it it it's thrown to other minorities in the United States to see, look, Asian people can do it, why can't you? So rather than uh, encouraging us again to look at the entire setup, we're told that the reason why we are in, uh, living in inferiorized conditions is because of our own uh, cultural failings um, as minorities or our own individual failings. And so in that first section, the author writes, racism can apply to Asians, um, but their struggle isn't about being able to be killed like a black person just walking down the street. And that's why the, um, the author really wants to make clear that we need to be more specific because blacks, black people face something very specific um, by being marked at that very bottom of that superiority measure that other uh, people of color don't. Um, and I'll move on. Again, you're welcome to use the chat and put a little asterisk there if you have a, have a question, a clarification or anything. You don't even have to put the asterisk, you can just type it in, but the asterisk would be if you wanna uh, say something uh, out loud.
Um, and uh, Sarah, I don't know if you want to continue reading. If you, if anyone feels read, uh, called to read, please uh, let us know in the chat. But for now, we'll continue with Sarah. If that's okay with you, Sarah. Sure. Um, Anti-blackness is one way. Some. Sorry, hit my mouse. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, Anti-blackness is one way some black scholars have articulated what it means to be marked as black in an anti-black world. It's more than just racism against black people that oversimplifies and defangs it. It's a theoretical framework that eliminates society's inability to recognize our humanity, the disdain, disregard, and disgust of our existence. And again, just pausing just to see if anyone would like to um, contribute something or a question or anything. It's so weird that I can't see, as a facilitator, I can't see folks, but um, again, feel free to put it in the chat. This question about uh, racism against black people, it's more than just racism against black people. In this society, we're usually taught that racism at its most extreme is using the N-word is in other words being individually racist against someone particularly black people and so what that hides is that racism can exist without racists racism is the entire makeup of that world which the author calls the anti-black world that world that is created against blackness like literally against Blackness is how it, it even creates its identity. And so when she writes that, when we say racism against black people, it oversimplifies and defangs it, oversimplifying in that it makes it seem as if it's just individuals being racist uh, and defangs it in that it, it makes it seem that it's not as not as horrifying as it actually is. Okay, and we'll continue. It's still you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I wanna make sure that um, if there's anyone else that would like to read, uh, mm -hmm. please. I'll pause for a sec, just in case anyone wants to jump in. Hold on, I'll follow up. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Can you can you say your name? Sorry. Oh, my name is Ross Fonts. Oh, hey, Ross. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Um, I'll go. Uh, the African American Studies professor Frank B. Wilderson, who coined the term Afro pessimism, argues that anti blackness index is the structural reality. So that in the, in the larger society, blackness is inextract, inextractably tied to slaveness. While the system of US chattel slavery technically ended over 150 years ago, it continues to mark the ontological position of black people. Thus in the minds of many, the relationship, the relations between humanity and blackness in an antagonism and antagonism is irreconcilable. Anti-blackness describes the inability to recognize black humanity. It captures the reality that the kind of violence that saturates black life is not based on any specific thing a black person better describes as a person who has been racialized black. Did the violence, racialized black did. The violence we experience isn't tied to any particular transgression. It's gratuitous and unrelenting. Any thoughts on that?
Sarah has an asterisk. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's just a thought. It's 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 nothing. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I've heard a lot of conversations uh, with people I've had, or just in yeah, mostly with people I've had. Um, kind of like why are why are black people still upset? You know, like civil rights was like fifty years ago or sixty years ago or whatever. Um, I guess they're kind of missing the point that uh, maybe like slavery ended or, or segregation, you know, technically legally ended. Um, it's still a pervasive like like thought pattern, or as you were like bringing out earlier, a structure of how society works that kind of puts you know black people in um, in the like how would you word it uh, like a lower as like. I don't know, like less than basically. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess when, when I look at that, and when it says that um, blackness is, is, is an antagonistic, antagonism and irreconcilable, I mean, it, it just goes to say that, you know, as long as, as we function within a capitalist system, there is no reconciliation with, you know, blackness within the capitalist system. So they're, they're, as long as the system is in, is in, is in, is intact, that this antagonism is, it's always going to be a part of the system because it holds it up. So when, in some of the previous portions, when you, when we talk about the model minority, it's like the the, that blackness is the bottom that holds up the structure because it keeps the it keeps the middle in line. That's how I kind of feel when in looking at that. Jabbar has an asterisk. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say I agree with them. Um, what he just said, you know, ha having to have uh, layers upon layers upon layers so you could have something less valuable and something more valuable in capitalism. And right now, uh, the ones at the top are the ones that that started this thing. So, I mean, but it could easily switch up, not easily switch up, but it could, um, per, you know, switch up where everybody's mixed up, but you will still always have a layer on top of layer on top of layer more value, less value all the time. And that's how capitalism has to work because you have to keep people, um, you have to keep people in a place. It doesn't have to be their place or whatever, but it has to be a place. And it's gonna be either less valuable or more valuable regardless. What do folks think about when she writes better described as quote, a person who has been racialized black. So rather than saying black person, she says better said a person who has been racialized black. Are there any thoughts on that? Sarah? Um, yeah, so like, for me, uh, what I think is, um, like, it's not intrinsic, like, it's not innate. It's something that's been created. Uh, yeah, r like, they have been given that title. Or, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, I agree with what you're saying there, because when you say when you're saying it's been racialized as black because earlier on when you were talking about other groups when you were saying like say for instance italians irish you know they were ethnic groups before they were were, were really racialized but in the context of controlling and identifying blackness they racialized blackness as a as a point of saying okay we, we'll let you take that black, we'll let you take that title, but it's an inferior one. And so I, I think that's kind of where that is because when you, when you really think about it, and even during um, 
the slave days in the Virginia colonies, you know, they had indentured servitude with the Irish people and the Irish were looked, they were looked down upon. But as the Irish and the Africans started uniting and things of that nature, and then the, the Irish were given certain type of, uh, they could work their way out of, out of enslavement when the African couldn't. So then they had to, in essence, let the Irish person into whiteness, even though it was at a lower degree. And they took it and they ran with it. And so uh, it's funny because with everything that's gone on today, uh, a person had asked me, why has it been so hard for African Americans to really assimilate into society? And they used the Irish as an example saying, well, the Irish were kind of in a caste, uh, a racial caste or ethnic ca caste, but they eventually worked their way out of it. And now like on the East Coast and in Chicago, you know, they're, they're celebrated for St. Patrick's. A lot of them are police officers and firefighters, but they, they were an ethnic group and we were an ethnic group that got racialized. And so we were called black or, or even more derogatory. And that kind of stuck with us along with, you know, the, the physical traits, I think. So that's kind of how I see that racialized black. Yeah, someone in the chat said it's, um, uh, it's not, it's not biological, it's a social construct. And I think that once you start, what, for folks who are uh, first coming in to reading about race, you come across this term a lot, it's a social construct, it's not biological. So society created the, yeah. the idea. And, and, and society created it, but I think that the, the degree of oppression has taken us as, as black people, we've taken the mantra and we've kind of tried to turn it into something positive because we didn't even really consider ourselves black until maybe the 60s, mm -hmm. right? Because you went from being, you know, just a nigga to Negro to colored. And then we, we took blackness as a, as a symbol and a sign of, of, of struggle, as a sign of being together. And so, and even today, people will debate that. You know, you have some African Americans or people consider themselves black where they don't, they don't want to be called black because black is not attached to anything. Black is not an ethnicity. Black is not a nationality. You know, you're not traced to a name. But it does come out of struggle language. You know, mm -hmm. and so people took that took that name and tried to make something of it. So I always look at it in my analysis of, of, of black culture, how we've had to take certain things and make good out of bad or make, you know, make wine out of water, so to speak. And that is an example. You know, because when you look, you know, now we want to use nigga and we want to use that as a, as a term of endearment. It's a far stretch, but it's kind of what we've been through. We took, we've taken um, last names. You know, a lot of us got Jones Smith. Those aren't our names, but we made good of them, right? We took the religion that was beat into us or, you know, indoctrinated from whatever ways and means, and we've tried to make good on those too. So it's a lot of analysis that needs to go on to kind of understand, you know, some of these things on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. That word ontology, you notice it in that first paragraph? Uh, chattel slavery technically ended over 150 years ago, it continues to mark the ontological position of black people. Mm -hmm. Ontology, again, is a, it's a philosophical term that talks about what makes something something. What, what is the nature of the thing? What makes a thing a thing? And so here she's saying, while the system of chattel slavery technically end it, it continues to mark what black people supposedly are. 
So in, in essence, you could say that's a stain on your being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right before that, she talks about uh, blackness being inextricably tied to slaveness. So even though slavery is formally dismantled, there's still this character that black people are, by the modern world, are understood to be at their function, their function as inferiors to the modern world, again, not naturally, but to the modern world, the, their function as inferiors allows to create the superior, the free person, uh, the white, for example. Yeah, you, you see that even in depiction of ancient history, they can, um, they'll, they'll depict ancient Egypt and they will, they will have either Europeans or Arabs seen as the pharaohs or the elite and they will still turn around and have a African person as the enslaved even though that's not a proper depiction because everybody knows that the Nile Valley came from Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. But when they do their depictions, they will make that person, they, they will still put Africans in there as the enslaved. So that's how they control the narrative with history and the psychological imp the impact of that as well. Up at the top, has um, in case folks are interested, she, the author was a student of this professor, uh, Frank B. Wilderson. He is actually at UC Irvine. And he coined the term Afro-pessimism. And uh, it's, it's actually really interesting to, um, I've been reading some of his stuff since I first learned about him in 2012. And I befriended a lot of his students and they, they uh, they, they're pretty challenging in a lot of ways, but in, in really great ways. Uh, and the, the idea of Afro-pessimism, it's, it's actually in the university. It, when I was in the university, it was very controversial. Um, those of us who really found it fascinating, uh, a lot of African-American studies professors didn't like us. Uh, it's growing though, it's growing in the university. It's, it's growing, uh, actually, I actually don't know because I have not, in the university as much, but I, it was growing when I left, but it is growing more like uh, outside the university as well. And the pessimism part, pessimism part, as I, uh, as I remembered, as I understood it, was this idea of resistance. Is it possible to resist within the modern world? And so that ends up being a, a very, very contentious point. Um, especially in seeing uh, Wilderson's life. If you want to read a, a, one of his book, he actually went to South Africa and fought with, uh, uh, with like the, the, high, the, the, the most militant movements uh, against apartheid. Was yeah. it the ANC? No, he did. Uh, well, yeah, he was part of the ANC, the more militant wing. Uh, okay. And so he has a, a massive critique of uh, Mandela, uh, understanding Mandela as kind of being those arrows that move up to try to be like the good black person versus the bad black person. And um, he has a really, uh, a great book, I thought, Ex excellent. It's called Incognito that talks about his life there. And from my reading of the pessimism of the part of Afro-pessimism uh, is that there's a lot of co-optation co uh, he's been part of movements and they they're easily co-opted and they don't get to like the root of the structure of the world to try to undo the world this modern world that we were talking about earlier so you'll you'll see that quite a bit if you youtube him uh ross actually just uh shared with me the other day a video ross read this article and googled wilderson but there's a whole school of thought it's not just wilderson uh if you're interested in that uh, that's who she's who she's talking about the other thing that last line uh, where she says the violence we experience isn't tied to any particular transgression it's gratuitous and unrelenting I don't know if folks have thoughts on that and I'll pause before I contribute anything 
Um, but I wonder if folks have any, any, any thoughts or questions or comments on that. About gratuitous violence. Well, I, I see it as this way. When it says that the violence we experience isn't tied to any particular transgressions, meaning that we don't have to do anything wrong, right? And it's gratuitous and unrelenting means that as long as we're here under that, the system, we can expect for it to be pretty persistent and um, continuous, the violence that we experience. And I guess you can trace that back to the anti-humanness title that, that has been put upon us so that even if we try our best to be that model minority or the good black person, you will still always be the inhumane slave person. That's how I read that. Apologies for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gratuitous uh, is exactly, yeah, you, black people don't have to do anything. And, and actually, Wilderson, like, he studied cinema. And I remember, I think when 12 Years a Slave came out, he talked about the difference between the novel and the film. And in the novel, there was examples of gratuitous violence against the enslaved, the, the, the enslaved black people in the plant, on the plantation. But on, in the film, they didn't do that. The film seemed to need a reason. If I remember right, I might be completely misquoting and forgetting what he said, but um, that the film didn't need or, or couldn't do that. The film, every time there was violence against black, a black person, there needed to be a reason for it. Um, but he talks about the actual reality is that there doesn't always have to be a reason for it. Or at least not a reason that we can directly point to. And what some scholars and thinkers, and not even scholars, but thinkers about this talk about the gratuitous violence against black people, uh, it's not for something black people do, but it's, it's, it's so that society can remember that it can be violent to black people because re reminding itself that it can be violent, that it can kill, that it can uh, cause so much destruction to black people is a reminder to themselves that they can and that they are, and because they can, they are superior. In the comments, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would just say, you know, in relation to the thing that went on with Mr. Floyd is just an, an exact representation of that. You know, where a person would feel superior and entitled enough to where they could say, it's my duty to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how, you know, you can see how this article connects to what's going on today to give you a, a deeper understanding. Because a lot of times we, when we see those things on TV, we're in shock and we're in awe and we're asking why, like how and why. But then when you, when you study and you know, you know, the depths of racism, the, 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 the corruptness of capitalism, you can understand you're not shocked. You're, you're sad and you're angered, but you know what the system and those who are within it are capable of doing. So it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't shock you as some people are, are, you know, really in shock with everything that has gone on. Even though we know these things have gone on, it's just they haven't been uh, video recorded. Mm-hmm. In the comments, we have a, a question or a comment from Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I thought, uh, as far as recent uh, stuff that's been in the uh, media and, and whatnot, that uh, the phone call from uh, in Central Park from Cooper regarding Cooper is was totally gregarious. 
and that there was no reason for that phone call. You know, um, that was totally done to show her superiority and what she figured society would come to her aid in, in trying to make herself feel super, superior. Yeah, and that uh, Dave in the comments uh, talked about how, uh, if he remembers correctly, Nell Irvin Painter, um, she has written a book, I forget the title, History of White People or History of Whiteness, I can't remember, uh, argues that whiteness isn't recognized as a race until the 1800s, so the foundation was of race was blackness. To go back to the presentation, the bottom had to be created so that the top could be defined, which is a really great example that Paul has just contributed. Um, uh, and, and this idea of what is gratuitous in order to remind yourself uh, that you can, in order to remind yourself of what your being is, you need to have the bottom in, and I wanna emphasize, in the modern world, not through nature, not, because there, and the reason why I say that is because there's other worlds. There, there are many other worlds that it have existed and exist that do not relate this way. And the reason why we don't know about them is by design, because we're supposed to think that this is just the way things are. Now, Jabbar, you have a, a question or a comment? Yeah, I was just going to go back kind of to the George Floyd thing because uh, I was talking to some dude the other day and he was saying, you know, you know, that's that's messed up. The pr police brutality, you know, it's, it's that was, you know, that that that, you know, he understands why people are protesting because of police brutality. And I told him that's not why people are, are pissed off, not because of the police brutality. Well, it was a brutal way in the way he died. I was like, fools get their heads cut off. They get shot in the chest they get shot in the face while they're laying down. But the thing is, if they catch them, especially on camera, something happens. They go to jail. They don't have the medical examiner say, well, no, he had underlying conditions. I mean, we can see from the video that he didn't die of COVID-19. And then we don't have the DA not trying to press any charges. And it's not just about the police because the dude Arbery the other day, he got shot by some dude and he wasn't a cop. And what what happened to him? Not them. That was that happened in February. They still haven't been a. Uh, uh, I don't know if anything's happened since, but they still weren't arrested for that. So the problem is not just the the stuff because stuff happens every day. And those individuals is it, terrible, is bad, uh, but the system itself is not doing anything when it happens to certain people. Like the dude and the the kid that killed over there uh, that went into another kid, but the person that went into the church in uh, Car Carolina, somewhere over there, and, and shot nine parishioners at the church. And when the cops caught him, what they do? They treated them to dinner. I mean, just imagine if it was the other way around. Would they treat them to dinner? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a really important point, too, that with uh, Ahmad Arbery, it wasn't police who did it. And uh, it, uh, and, and if you read more about uh, in the Black radical tradition and particularly Afro-pessimist scholars, they talk about how white people themselves become deputized. You don't have to be police. Uh, citizens themselves become deputized as police without the formal name to keep people in their place. And like Jabbar is mentioning and face no consequences because they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing according to this world, this anti-Black world. There's Sarah also, uh, uh, who has a comment or question? Yeah, um, just kind of going back to that, uh, how the, the violence we experience is inside any particular transgression. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, usually it is not, most definitely. Um, kind of like being Black is almost like having a target on your back in a lot of instances, uh, if not all. Um, but a lot of times they will, or people or society, whatever, uh, will try to come up with a reason afterwards um, to justify the violence. Like they'll try to discredit a person. Um, like there's a, people are, were trying to like discredit George Floyd or, or something like that. Um, so they try to look for a reason. There doesn't need to be a reason. 
Nicolette in the chat says something similar. Many times the violence is justified by the perpetrator by attacking the character of the victim or using their fear for their safety or their whiteness as a reason for being violent. That happens nope. all the time. Like someone ends up like uh, their entire life comes under scrutiny to try to find something that they may have done wrong that had nothing to do with anything. And that ends up being the justification that they shouldn't exist. Yeah, that's, that's, um, I mean, we're seeing it now with, with certain people. I don't even want to mention their names, uh, but they're saying, oh, well, he had a record or he had had previous run-ins with the law or whatever they want to do to justify an execution. You know, they want to not only uh, kill you physically, they, they want to kill you they want to character assassinate you as well, but that's just given because if you are seen as less than and they are constantly at war with you, the culture creates that mindset. And so if that's part of the culture, politics and policy is going to follow that culture. And that's why they say, okay, we, we need to address systemic racism. They don't say we need to address racism or prejudice. They say racism within the system. And I think, you know, this article right here just shines a light on, you can't just say, okay, we need to address systemic racism, which is, you know, a dubious thing to do. But on the further end of that spectrum is anti-blackism. And that needs to be addressed and not forgot because as we move forward and we see the movement from so many people who are, who are just disgusted with that. But your the message, well, not really the message, but the true essence of what we need to really be addressing can be, can be manipulated and watered down and erased or forgotten. And, um, you know, 30 years from now, the people who marched at the community center be trying to figure out how this all happened again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion um, uh, when we don't understand the structure of the world. There's just, um, Jabbar has an asterisk a, a comment or question. No, never mind. Okay. Uh, then there's uh, Tim. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Testing one, two, three. We can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I put some of this in the chat. It just feels very relevant to this exact com conversation where um, in this article uh, that the VC star just published about yesterday's hit and run, we see the police of hundreds of us who witnessed this hit and run, and yet the police interviewed the driver and said, oh, it was just an accident. They didn't mean to, even though we watched them, watched the big gratuitous violence, like he just drove into people because he could. Um, so it just really brings it home how this definition of gratuitous violence is playing out right here in Ventura County. And what Tim's referring to is that yesterday we had a protest and march um, here in Ventura, and uh, toward the end, a, a white truck driver ran through some of the protesters, and he shared that uh, the story in the chat. If anyone's interested? Oh, can I say one thing real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, well, just, just about like the you know, I mean, the excuses and stuff. Like when Trayvon Martin got killed, they said that he was wearing a hoodie, that he was a certain height, like that was a, like that mattered. You know, I mean, like he was tall. And like he smoked weed before and, you know, he did school before. Yeah, just like all those excuses. Um, but what I wanted to say is it's something that we don't really even see all the time. Um, uh, just the other day, my homeboy, my white homeboy from work, same age as me, um, he rides his bike. I ride my bike too. So he rode his bike to one of the stores. He had his backpack on, his hat, his sunglasses. And so he goes into the store and they tell him to take his backpack off. And he was telling me, like, I... You know, I didn't, yeah, they told me to take my backpack off and I didn't have any problem with that. So I'm just looking at him thinking, 
what makes you think that you could even go in the store with sunglasses, a hat, and a backpack? You know what I mean? What make, and I was just thinking, there's no way I would go into the store with a backpack, much less sunglasses and a hat. You know what I mean? So I'm just like, man, and we don't realize that. You know what I mean? We don't realize, like, hey, we don't let our kids walk around in the store holding on to stuff, playing with stuff, because they're going to think that we're stealing it or something. So I, that's a little like kind of under underlying thing that that you know I me mean, I think I've talked to some black people that that feel the same way I do and I think a lot more do like hey yeah we're not going to be walking around with the stuff in the store so just that little underlying stuff that 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 we uh, deal with too that we don't really even see yeah everyday life yeah okay uh, maybe we'll move on to the next I skipped over this slide because it was the paragraph that we just read that was the second paragraph on that previous slide and I accidentally left it in it was this bottom paragraph but here uh, we'll go on to the next paragraph um, uh, Christian Christian would you like to read it uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Because blackness covers the fact that society's hatred of blackness and also its gratuitous violence against black people is complicated by its need for our existence. For example, for white people, again, but are described as those who have been racialized white, the abject inhumanity of the black reinforces their whiteness, their humanness, their power, and their privilege, whether they're aware of it or not. Black people are at once despised and also a useful counterpoint for others to measure their humanness against. In other words, while one may experience numerous compounding disadvantages, at least they're not Black. Thank you, Christian. You know, that, that, that reminds me of who is the 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 older uh, white woman who talks about racism? Uh, older gray-haired woman, real snappy. Peggy McIntosh. Uh, I don't know. She's always doing workshops on racism and things of that nature. And she was in a classroom of, of uh, white students, and then she asked them. You know, her first question is, who in here would like to be black? Please stand up. And no one stood up. And so she says, because you know that it's hard to be black. And so that that last that last one about at least they're not black. I think a lot of people feel that way and probably feel um, maybe ashamed to even admit it to themselves, but you can see it, you know, acted out in their actions, you know, and sometimes it's, um, you know, you, you see it, you see it not only in white communities, but with other minorities and how they interact with black people or how they feel about them. And, that, and, the, and it has that, that undercurrent of, at least they're not black and they don't want to be black and they don't want you to get your blackness on them. Mm Yeah, and this paragraph has that, uh, what we were talking about a little bit, maybe if, if folks have maybe more thoughts on that, that that paradox that, this, that society hates blackness, but also needs it. Okay. 
in, in, a, in, a, in a science fiction way, I'm like, man, if there wasn't any black people, man, what, what would happen with the rest of the world? There'd be, the order would be thrown off. So they probably have to keep some of us around. They can't let us all be studies in anthropology. Yeah, and that was the big, the big uh, destabilization and the threat of runaway, runaway slaves is that when they escaped, there's no bottom, no foundation anymore for the master to exist as master. I figured that out. Yeah. And, but here we're talking about humanness, no? Like not just master, but like that we're understood as humans in a society that centers the human and gives the human rights. That then we need the non-human and sometimes in the black radical tradition you'll hear it called the anti-human the the, the non-human or the anti-human uh, is necessary in order for this idea of the human the political human or you know whatever we may want to call it the one with rights the one that can be protected the one with freedoms to exist and so then there's that dual, the hatred of blackness and also the need for blackness. And Jabbar, someone put in the comment, Adriana put in the comments, uh, or was it Ross? Ross, uh, were, were you talking about Jane Elliott? Is that who you were talking about? Yes, yes, yeah. that's her. And Nicolette writes, this reminds me of the quote, if only we loved black people as much as we love black culture. Yeah. Elements of black culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, in, the entertainment part. But yeah, I, I see what the meaning is. Yeah. Right. Should we move on to the next, or is there anything else that calls out to us on this paragraph? I think Paul put an asterisk. Oh, Paul, thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I just, um, oh, the last part of the discussion about the need for blackness, I have a little bit of a hard time with that in that I think in societies that didn't have blacks, or they, they still found people to be on the bottom. You know, you, you, really easy example, I guess, would be uh, Nazi Germany, where you know they went after the Jews and the Gypsies and the Slavs, and, and so right now we may be seeing. Um, you know, everything you're saying as far as, as um, how American society has operated. But um, I don't know that there's quite what, what I don't think I agree with um, or the part about the, a real need for blackness is that there, there's a real need for somebody a group of people to be at the bottom. Jabbar, you have an asterisk? Yeah, and that's actually what I, that's kind of what I was kind of saying earlier, that you need somebody at the, with more value, somebody more valuable, somebody, something less valuable, somebody, so if there's no black people, um, probably brown people, you guys are better watch out because they'll be looking at you next, you know what I mean? Because they just need somebody. You know, they need to find somebody and, and it's, you know, and it could be flipped one day. Who knows? I mean, just, I mean, highly unlikely, but you never know. But under the capitalist system, you need something. You need to have that ca that caste system. You need to have something more valuable and less valuable. So you, you just need something at the bottom, something at the top. You know, I mean, that's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is, um, this is great because uh, again, Blackness is a structural position. They wouldn't say that, it just exists. 
but when they're talking about blackness, they are talking about the structural position of inferiority. And there's actually a really interesting debate about is it just the United States or is it global? And uh, if it's tied to capitalism, like how Jabbar is mentioning, and if capitalism has become global, are black people then, uh, also, is that also anti-blackness has also become global? So there's a, a very interesting debate about that. Um, that is, is, is really interesting to even just watch right now with uh, Black Lives Matter protests um, that have sprung up all over the world, like, you know, investigating what is it that calls out to them. Uh, no, okay, so there are no more asterisks. Maybe we'll move on to the next paragraph, unless anyone else. Okay, so Adam. Is it asterisk how you raise your hand? I guess I was trying to figure out the raising hand situation. Yeah, it's in the comments. Yeah. Do you have a, suge a comment, Roberto? Uh, yeah, on. just a, a brief one and kind of related to the the thread of the conversation already. But I guess um, what I'm hearing is that it's what it what it does is it reveals blackness as a structural location that can be inhabited in different contexts by different people. And I and I say this more drawing from some of the work of some of my comrades in South Africa. Right, who say, well, we have to address these questions differently because when we look uh, uh, across not just South Africa, but other places, you know, it's not as clear cut as like, well, this is a black and this is a white, right? So, so there's a Tendai Sithol is the uh, name of this uh, South African who just wrote a book called The Black Register. Uh, which which is really really intriguing work uh, along these lines and and I've heard this uh, in a slightly different way in um, among Malaysians and uh, people in that part of the world right in terms of uh, they don't have an anti-blackness per se although it plays out differently in terms of definitely a foreignness uh, that ends up occupying that structural location although even there it's a debate in terms of uh, Tamil and others that are darker Asians that end up filling that place at times, so, though not exclusively. Thanks, Roberto. Okay, we'll move on to the next paragraph, and Adam, uh, volunteer to read. Hi. Um. So when we're trying to understand how a white police officer could calmly and casually channel the weight of his entire body through his knee on a black man's neck, a man who begged for his life for over eight full minutes until he had no air left with which to plead, we have to understand that there, there has never been a moment in this country's history where this kind of, of treatment hasn't been the reality for black people. Thank you, Adam. Have you all heard folks, uh, I mean, that last, sen that last part, we have to understand that there has never been a moment in this country's history where this kind of treatment has not been the reality for black people. Does anyone think that that would be controversial or would people would uh, readily agree with that? I think for people who have their head in a hole, 
that don't want to deal with the reality. And then because there are people who will, um, you know, kind of divert you from that state by throwing other niceties of how well people have done or, you know, you, you have the Bob Johnsons of the world or the Michael Jordans of the world. So it, it must not be that bad. You know, so they will explain it away with um, a few of the, I guess, uh, capitalist trinkets that people get along the way, and they'll try and keep you away from the uh, the violence as being normal and consistent and persistent throughout since uh, fourteen, since fourteen, nineteen, sixteen, nineteen. So, yeah. In 1619 being the first year, well, the time, the, the first, the year that the first African enslaved person was brought. Into the colonies. And notice here that uh, she says this country's history and earlier, uh, I think she called it an anti-Black world, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can go back to that. Because we're having this. Uh, uh, maybe she didn't call it world. I can't remember. Maybe she said society. Yeah. I'll go back. Towers of that. Yeah, maybe in this article, she's just uh, focused on the US. That's important because there is a, a, within this field, within, within the, the, this school of thought, there's a, a the debate about, is it the world? Is it global? Is it just the US? Adam, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I have a question about like the, the part of like the eight, full minutes of the video um because i've heard like many different understandings of seeing like black bodies on social media and like on the news where like some people would argue like it's good it's important to share these incidents and it's like to inform the people and it's different from the past now we're using social media to like tell everyone like what's happening with all like the information that is being set like shared but also like there's another argument where like um don't share black bodies being like killed or black people like dying or being killed so you're not i'm not sure how to say this word but it's like decent to size i think and i've heard the same argument similarly with like palestine before but now i'm like confused uh, because what would you do? Like, if you see something like this happening, would you share it? Should we share it? Is it something we should talk about and like share? Is it, are we now like normalizing black deaths or, or like black people dying? Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm really confused in this point. Jonathan in the comment says, feel you, Adam. Yeah, I think you you kind of have to figure out when is it desensitizing, when is it sensationalizing, and when is it, you know, reality. You know, I I I was horrified when I watched the, the one dude get shot in South Carolina who got shot in the back like six times for a traffic ticket when the police officer said he went for his gun. And uh the fellow who turned it in was the immigrant gentleman who was afraid to turn it in. And the guy got shot in the back six times and neither the autopsy or the officer who signed off on it thought anything was suspicious on, based on his, based on the officer's story. And so you see those things and 
I mean, it didn't desensitize me. I wonder about the youth, though, because they play a lot of, you know, violent type games and, you know, play the uh, army games and things of that nature. So I, I wonder for them, is it seeing something like that on the news and the media, is it, is it passe? Um, but I, I, I guess from the movement and seeing so many young people up and out with this, with the, uh, with the, the killing of Mr. Floyd, maybe they aren't as desensitized as we think. You know, I don't know. Jabari, you have a comment? Hey, I was just thinking about this, the same thing. I mean, um, I think one thing that the people are not desensitized with uh, is the injustice. You know, if they're not desensitized with uh, with somebody doing something so bad like that and then not having nothing happen to them. I think they feel that, man, imagine if that was them and then nothing happened because that could happen, you know I mean? That can happen to a lot of people and, and imagine if nothing even happened, nobody even cared. That would just be, I mean, that's just, that's the worst of the worst. So I don't know. Yeah, and true, I think, you know, sometimes you got to see stuff that's really bad, you know what I mean? Because if, uh, if you don't see it, uh, then do you really know what's happening? Because it's, it's just something that's been going on and it hasn't gotten worse. It's just something that's been going on for, um, for the long time. The only time I remember a big old giant thing about it was in the, was in 92, you know, and a couple of other times. I didn't see that many, you know, in my lifetime, I didn't see that many um, uprisings. And you, usually when there was, it was because it was caught on tape, you know? So I think uh, I think it's a g good thing to show, hey, you know what, this is what's happening. See with your own eyes and, and, and then go out there and, you know, uh, make, it, make it hard on them, <laughs> you know what I mean? Burn some shit. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next paragraph? Uh, if there is any, is there any other volunteer to read that next paragraph? I'll read it. Or that next slide, go ahead with the next slide. Um, there's something on the screen. Oh, shoot, sorry. All right, from, whip, from whips to guns, the slave patrol of the 18th century are the ancestors of modern day police departments. Mr. Floyd's killer just happened to make the news, happened to, be, happened to have video footage documenting his desperate screams to his deceased mother for help from the other side. Mr. Floyd's brutal killing is not an exception, but rather it is a rule in a nation that literally made black people into things. Black people were rendered as property, built this country, spilled literal blood, sweat, tears into the soil from which we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. The thingification of black people is, fun is a fundamental component of the identity of this nation. Have folks been seeing, um, or did folks know, or are you just learning now about the history of the unbroken chain between the slave patrols of the 18th century with the modern day police? Have you seen more of that coming up on social media recently, or have you not seen it at all? Does it surprise you? Lisette? 
I guess I don't know how much to share. I, I recently had something traumatic happen to me and I had to wrestle with the fact of reporting it or not. Um, and I, I had to think about that history of the police and look up the history some more and sorry, it's kind of emotional to talk about, but um, it's just kind of traumatizing when you don't have systems in place to help you without the police. You don't have that justice there to support you and you're like, where do I go? You know, the police isn't, isn't it, but you're like stuck between a rock and a hard place and it's devastating. <laughs> Thank you, Lisette. On the chat, Jonathan writes, I've heard more white people talking about this week and Nicolette, I've seen many people speaking on it at protests. It's interesting to see how the names change, but the function remains the same. So um, outlawing chattel slavery and dismantling the plantations, uh, the function of slaveness continued even, even if uh, without, without the plantation. And, um, if you've watched the, there's a documentary, I think it's on Netflix, yeah, on Netflix that we watched with uh, a long time ago. Uh, Ross, you were there many years ago uh, when we were doing these studies. Um, it's called thir uh, 13. And it talks about how, you know, with, uh, with so-called emancipation, you end up getting um, the idea that uh, with the 13th Amendment, that you could still be enslaved or at least treated like you were a slave if uh, you were a criminal. And so then we have a lot of writing today about mass incarceration, the book, uh, Michelle and Alexander's book, but also there's a lot of other writers that talk about uh, what Alexander in her book calls the new Jim Crow. So how these names, the names change, but the logic remains, the logic of, um, having someone down at the at the very bottom in order to uh, have society have cohesion to have it make sense and so the slave patrols that name change but then they become the police and so you know we have this victory we feel like of disbanding slave patrols but then they just become police Adam? Yeah, I was gonna say like that was not like the most surprising thing to me. Um, uh, like thinking back of like how all this was like built on like systemic violence and like killing of um, ind indigenous people. I think what maybe was like a little bit shocking, like just a little bit for a very short time was like, people talking about like the protection of property where probably there is the blood and sweat of black people building them uh, than actually like talking about like um, black people's like lives. Um, so like here seeing like the, I think she calls it the thingification or like making black people into properties but not even like that important like the buildings are more important it's like don't hurt the buildings but it's like no one cares about you know it's crazy i think this part just even just like the thought like because i think it's also like a different kind of violence that like you're not actually like it would be like a comment or like something um, but yeah
Chavar? Yeah, and I think that's kind of a, a thingification kind of thing. I think that's when you're talking about either an enslaved person or a slave. Because an enslaved person is a person that's enslaved that has to, you know, but a slave is, you, you don't even put person into it. You just, it's just slave. You know, I mean, you, that's what you are. The other one is what you become, you know, what you, uh, what you have to do. The other one is what you are. So, I mean, that's that thingification thing. And, but it all comes down to, and it all comes down to capitalism because just like, uh, like the NFL recently, I don't know if you guys heard, but the NFL was like, oh, you know what, we were wrong about, you know, I mean, black people not having to take a knee and that, like, you know, I mean, like they care, you know, like they were thinking about that. They're not thinking about that. They don't care about that. They're thinking about profit. That's it. And, and that's when, you know, that's why you got to burn some stuff because if they're thinking about, um, that's what they're thinking about. It's all about money, you know, you know, so, and yeah, who cares if, uh, if somebody takes some junk from, uh, the CVS or the Rite Aid, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't equate to taking a life, no matter how much junk you take from there. So I don't know, but it, it seems like it always comes back to money. And Sarah writes, it's profitable to be pro-black lives right now. Why would it, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Why, why do we think it might, that might be so profitable to be pro-black lives right now? That, that's just where the temperature is. <laughs> Um, I think I think for some people, uh, Kiki, I think for some people it's comfortable right now to be pro-black lives because to me right now it's it is and it isn't actually it, it, the term black lives is just it's so abstract because we haven't really done the hard work and the drudgery to really define what that means. Because then you have to start thinking about the systemic issues in health, you know, in policing, the, the justice, economics. You know, when you start addressing them, and if you're earnestly look at them, for some black lives will not be popular again because it's going to take a sacrifice that people aren't willing to do. And, uh, and, and that's one of the things, whether you're talking about a revolutionary change or a radical change or a soft feel good progressive change, people, I'm not, I'm not convinced and history has, has, has made me feel this way that people aren't really you know, ready to make that change. And, and part of it, I think, is just the educational component because I think people are frustrated and they see the injustice, they see the violence, but the system itself is organized, is strong, is funded. So it's gonna take more than marches. It's gonna take more than a Black Lives Matter poster it's, it's, it's going it might take you a lifetime where you don't even you don't even get the fruits of the labor it might come to another generation and i don't know if people are really ready to struggle on that level because that's a serious commitment when you think of it that way and and we've been we're such a fast food tiktok snapchat quick gratification society it's going to be a challenge, you know, it doesn't mean it can't happen. It's just that there are so many hurdles that we have to take into consideration. Jabbar in the chat writes, um, well, you know, the, to Sarah's point of it's profitable to be pro black lives right now, Jabbar writes, or not profitable to be the opposite right now. Exactly, it's not profitable to be the opposite. Therefore, they must be pro-black. And Sarah, that was Christy and Sarah. Right, it's good point, Jabbar and Christy. 
and uh, Adam, I think you are next on Adam and then Christian. I think this point, like it's related to everyone saying like about like capitalism and to also what the article is saying about like the like anti-blackness of like the whole system is built that way. And I think for these corporations or like NFL where um, it's like if they see black lives as like property, it's like a good investment now. Like it's before they were just like uh, taking the revenues without like putting any effort in investing. But now it's really important to invest in this kind of property because, yeah, because of like the resistance or the movement that's happening now. But I don't, I'm not sure if like, it's like now they're becoming like not anti-black or anti-blackness. It's just like a different way of weaving like capitalism into what's happening still being into black and still profiting of like black bodies and black lives um so yeah it's really yeah the co-optation of resistance um let's see and tess also yeah tess uh yeah it's what we exact one example one of many the nfl just now coming out to say black lives matter yeah uh, and then there was uh, Christian. Yeah, so in response to what Sarah said that it's profitable to, to be pro-Black Lives right now, I've definitely been observing this as more and more brands come out and make their statements. Um, and this has come at the same time that we're also seeing people like calling um, the public to take action to divest from certain companies that haven't been making statements and, and all that. So um, I think like, unfortunately, I, I see that some of these companies, you know, if they're just making like a, a statement, like a bare minimum and not making donations or um, not making enough contributions when, when you look at the ratio of like how they spend their money, um, I think it, it could just be a strategy too. Like I know that some people are thinking that this like this Black Lives movement is just a moment and that it's going to go away. So for a company to just make a statement is kind of like, you know, a strategy to stay in place and to not lose out on um on profits. And so I, I think that we do have to be cautious of that. And those companies that do make statements, if they still exist you know in the future i'm um, holding them accountable but uh yeah i i do see that happening um like patagonia i i had seen this video of a person who was like um verbally attacking someone else with some degrading comments and they were wearing a patagonia shirt and that person ended up getting soft and um like two days later i saw a statement by patagonia uh talking about like the uh, connection with like environmental justice and taking action with uh, Black Lives Matter right now. So, yeah, I see that. Thanks, Christian. And Carrie? Yeah. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to say along the same lines that um, if companies make that statement because it's good for optics and they hope to bring people in and spend money there because they're, you know, on board with the movement, that's not what we need. What we need is for them to follow up that performative action with changes in their um, the makeup of their boards, for instance, and other policies to show that they support their workers well. Looking at it deeper and had seeing them take effective action like that, that's when we know that they really mean it. And most most of them are not doing that. Jabbar and then, oh, uh, we have Jabbar on the stack and then Ross and then Roberto. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that was exactly right. I mean, yeah, people are over there just giving lip service to shut everybody up so they can go back to business as usual and continue to make money. And then you got other people out there, you know what I mean, joining the protesters like Mitt Romney, you know what I mean, walking with Black Lives Matter protesters, but voting against every bill uh, put before them, you know, that would that would do something about it. Then you got chiefs of police out there walking and marching and stuff. That's not your job. Your job is to be 
to how about you report somebody? I mean, that's what you could do with your where you're at right now. You could go ahead and report one of those, you know, or all of them. You know what I mean? Because to me, I think all cops are bad. I can explain that later. But you could go ahead and start doing your, you know, your job. The reason you're not doing your job is the reason we're out here. So don't come and start walking with us or walking with anybody when you're the one, you're the reason. You know what I mean? Not that, I mean, yes. You know, so I don't know. It's just lip service to me. It seems like it. Uh, uh, Ross? Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like it's the politically correct thing to do is to put out a statement and say this and say that. I mean, I mean, it was I was shocked that Jordan put a hundred million dollars up, but why don't you just give it to ACLU or 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 some type of defense fund that fights that prosecutes police officers? Or why well, you know. Go ahead and, and fund them a little more. I know Dak Prescott gave a million dollars to police training. What are they going to do, buy dogs with it? Shit, I don't know. But it seems to be that's trending. You know, so if, if you're going to make, if like you said, okay, did you, did you change the composition of your CEOs and your boards? You know, did any of that, did any of those sentiments touch those areas that are really affected by over-policing? And so you got to start really being a little bit more, um, you know, skeptical and watching more than, because people are going to say what they say, but then do they really, really support, you know, systemic change? Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take more than saying, hey, Patagonia doesn't support, you know, this and that, Black Lives Matter, but then they don't have no, they don't have any people of color or any black people in any important positions there. So, you know, we, we just got to let the dust settle. And I think we'll see who's who. And for some of us, it, it'll be kind of painful because they had, they were idealistic about what they thought. And then for others, we know it's business as usual. It's just part of the, part of the, part of the, the scheme of things, you know, understanding, you know, how systems work and how they'll, they'll kind of, the ebb and flow of trying to appease certain people, but still keeping their game going. Thanks, Ross. It's Roberto, and then after that, Tim. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, everything that's been happening right now, it's been uh, making me think a lot of uh, old texts uh, written by Robert Allen named Black Awakening in Capitalist America, 1972. And Robert Allen, you know, very importantly kind of points out how uh, at the time he was doing work as a journalist and he uh, was hearing this phrase, black power all over the place, right? But the more you hear black power and he's writing this in early 1970, 71 probably, uh, that he started noticing differences within how people were invoking the notion of black power and how at one point you even had uh, Richard Nixon embrace black power, uh, but meaning black capitalism, black elected officials, right? So, so the the second point of Allen is to me is is really key, and I bring this up because I I fear something similar is happening right in front of our eyes with Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, differentiating the different invocations of black power on the one hand, but also noting the state response. So in the case of Black Power, right, he calls that Black capitalism, Black elected officials, um, more broadly, Black bourgeoisie. But then he says the other two main tendencies, and there's more, but he highlights these three, Black bourgeoisie, um, cultural nationalists, which was like, uh, you know, more folks like us and so on. And then revolutionary nationalists like Panthers and, and others. And in terms of state response, the state response was obviously to embrace the black capitalists and the black elected officials and try to incorporate them into a system. Whereas with um, black cultural nationalists, it was more a matter of like, sure, go ahead, wear your dashiki, grow out your fro, speak Swahili, uh, let's see how we could make some money off that. And to the extent that you don't talk about politics and and broader transformation, it's all good. 
So they were tolerated, right? But in the case of revolutionary nationalists, uh, they were either killed or uh, incarcerated, incapacitated in diverse ways. So, so I think when you kind of like get out ahead of this in advance and, and point out to these, point out these various different tendencies that we're already seeing within uh, Black Lives Matter, right? That not all uh, all of the people espousing it are necessarily of a revolutionary transformative politics. And that already you're seeing invocations of it more in the direction of, you know, this incorporation into the, the, the state mechanisms and capitalist mechanisms. So, so to be attentive to that, right? And, and, and I'll have to differ is not just wait and see how it pans out, but actively make those distinctions, right? Uh, um, I keep hearing folks say, oh, we have to follow black leadership. And I'm sorry, I'm not gonna follow black leadership if all they're doing is talking about peaceful protests and vote in November, you know? So we need to make those distinctions about critical positions emerging from black lived experience, not, not just any black boys is automatically you know, to automatically want to be followed. We, we still need a politics that is inserted uh, in, in within that. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, Tim? Yeah, uh, Roberto, you said a lot of what I was thinking about, but much more in depth and thoroughly. All I would build on that is just like pointing out that we're talking about hegemony that even predates capitalism and the Christian church has a long history of absorbing counter movements like St. Francis of Assisi is a great example. And so I think this is a moment where we have to say, and I think this is a big difference between the kind of radical or escape framework that you're talking about, Kiki, and the more liberal one that says, let's hold these corporations accountable. And I would say instead, let's rec rec recognize that this is a time to contest, contest, uh, contest hegemony. That's not quite the right, but I'm, I'm trying to draw on a, Jonathan Matthew Smucker's Hegemony How To, and he really says, in these moments, you actually, you, you can't retreat, you have to actually fight in the way that you're talking about, Roberto, to, to push and make sure that, that, because it is a moment where this is a conversation, just the way black power was in the late 60s and 70s, it has a lot of, it's, it's part of the zeitgeist. And so how do we actually engage with that rather than retreating is a really big question right now. Resist, resist, resist. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, in the chat, Carrie was saying if they're about the corporations, if their philosophical stance costs them money and they still follow through, that's another sign they mean it. And Sarah writes, politics work the same way here to go with what is popular but still functioning within the same capitalistic system that that hates, hates castes, that benefits at the cost of others, uh, or has castes. In this case, particularly black people, the only time in the past that the government did concede, especially towards black rights, is when the system was in danger of functioning. Should we move on to the next section? Okay, uh, who would like to read? We can have Jabbar read again, or uh, if someone doesn't want to. All right. Reckoning with this reality is significantly more difficult than wrestling with prejudice, racism, and even institutional or structural racism. And it does more than any of these concepts do to help us make sense of over 400 years of black suffering of unrelenting, unremitting, interminable pain, rage and exhaustion of our, I didn't see that your picture was in a way. Uh, Mr. Floyd's death is the story of our babies of the numerous black children who grow up literally or metaphorically under the steel heel of a po police boot. It is the story of our families 
who since the middle passage have had to suffer the unimaginable. Jabbar. What would make wrestling with this reality that the author is describing, that Ross is talking about, significantly more difficult than wrestling with prejudice, racism, and even institutional or structural racism? That's one prompt. Another prompt is that that next sentence where she writes, and it does more than any of these concepts do to help us make sense of over 400 years of black suffering. And I'm curious if, if you agree with that. Do you think that the way that we're talking about things right now through looking at the structure of the anti-black society that we're in, does that help make more sense? Sarah? Yeah, um, I guess uh, to clarify the, the prompt, I guess um, talking about the signification of, of, of black people, like that reality, is that what you're asking? Oh, well, I was just really just repeating her first and her second sentence. Like, do you, um, do you agree with the author when the author re says that reckoning with this reality is significantly more difficult? Uh, because we, we hear a lot about uh, racist police um, prejudice or racism. And, we, and then probably more sophisticated analyses talk about institutional racism or structural racism, uh, but again, she's trying to work against this idea that uh, what black people face is something as general as racism. She wants to make it more specific, anti-blackness. And so that's, uh, she says that it's significantly more difficult to wrestle with the reality of anti-blackness than with questions of prejudice or racism or institutionalized racism or structural racism. Uh, and so just, I'm, I'm curious if folks agree with that and if so, why, and if not, why? Um, and then the other thing that she says is that um, she believes that doing it though, even though it's significantly more difficult to reckon with it, to reckon with it, it helps more than any of those other concepts make sense of the reality that black people have been living in this country over the last 400 years. Do you agree that that helps make more sense than these concepts? Um, yeah, I think it's definitely, well, I guess I'm having a hard time, but like, uh, just understanding, but it, it wouldn't make more sense if that, if anti-blackness is tied into the identity of something like this nation particularly, because like just from like a psychological standpoint, if you take away someone's or something's identity, then it can't like function anymore. So why that would be more difficult makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like an existential. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, Tess? Um, I think so. So how I'm understanding what she's saying, um, I, I do agree it does more than any of these concepts to help us make sense of the, over 400 years. Um, I feel like reckoning with the history for me 
helps me understand why, helps me wrestle with prejudice, racism, and institutional structural racism. So I think it's tied, for me at least, and, and what I'm seeing for other white folks. Um, for some, uh, it's more hard, but for me, I guess it, it helps. It's almost easier than just looking at prejudice and racism as their own things that aren't rooted in something else. Adam? Um, I think I would say I agree, but I'm also like, I'm gonna ask like a small question. Because I think my understanding is the differentiation here is like racism would just be in a basic understanding of just discriminating against someone just because of their race. And in that understanding, we would equate the whatever races we white people make up and then like how they would discriminate or like violate these people. But I think what this article is trying to do is like, no, you cannot equate black lives with everybody else because this is a special case. This is anti-blackness. It's not just the general racism against everyone who's not white. It's literally against just people who are black. And in that sense, like I would agree. I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly though, so correct me. Thanks, Adam. And Carrie in the chat says, agreed with uh, assuming those, that first paragraph. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, the author references the middle passage, um, which is an important, extremely important uh, moment and geography and calendar, you know, calendar and geography, moment and, and geography um in history and that's referenced from by the uh, black radical tradition quite a bit because that's this is the moment where africans become that become slaves they weren't they weren't slaves in in the way that the modern world made them at all or weren't even slaves in africa but it, it this transform this the atlantic there's a lot of writing a lot of haunting writing about the Atlantic, the Middle Passage. And someone said, can't hear me. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Oh. I can hear, oh. Oh, Carrie had accidentally turned off my sound. Okay, cool. Um, should we, um, is there anything else about this, these two paragraphs we wanna look at? We can move on to the next one. Um, does somebody want to volunteer to read it, the next one? I'll pause. Uh, Sarah? Um, sure. But when they kill our children, our mothers and fathers, we're expected to forgive, to be peaceful in the face of horrific violence. We're asked to respect a law that cannot recognize our humanity, that cannot provide redress. redress. Um, and when time and time again, the law demonstrates it will never protect us, that it will never hold those individuals and systems that harm us accountable. We are expected to peddle a narrative that the system works, that justice will prevail. Does this, does this uh, resonate with what you all see that black people are expected to be peaceful, to forgive, asked to respect the law? Um, do, do, is that what you see? And, and if so, um, do you have thoughts about that? Uh, or if not, if you don't see that, um, could you say a bit more? Like, 
what does this uh, maybe another way to put it uh sarah says yes yes what do you think the work of asking black people to forgive and to be peaceful what does that work do for the structure of society keeps everything in check uh what malcolm x says um if you're if you're respectable and responsible to your own oppression, right? That's what they want you to do, is to follow the rules, even though you're being slaughtered, that you're being irresponsible to yourself and to your ancestors who were in the struggle. But we don't, we don't really learn that narrative. I mean, I don't, you know, just, just this discussion right here, where else would you have that discussion? You're not even having it at a college or high school, let alone middle school, to really have this discussion and, you know, really think beyond the, 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 what, the broad brush, the broad brush painted term racism without even delving any deeper into it. And, you know, so when you look at anti-blackness and then you, you look at systemic issues, it makes a lot of sense. What, this, this is not science fiction, it's not far-fetched. You, when you read that term, anti-blackness, and then you look at every social index in the country, it makes sense, right? But then um, we're kind of indoctrinated and trained to believe, you know, that the system of things works for you. I, I remember, um, getting in an argument with one of my friends who happened to be Latino. And I told him that um, I wasn't going to vote for Hillary or Trump. I was just, you know, I wasn't going to vote. And he lost his freaking mind. And he told me, you know, man, I can't believe a black person would tell me they're not going to vote when people died for you to vote. I said, people died for me regardless. They've been dying for, for centuries, and they died for me to have the right to vote, not to vote, just vote for anything. So I said, I don't see either one of them as, you know, worthy for being president. And I knew there was going to be some heat that was going to hit the community either way. And so it was just bound to happen. And so, but now... You know, as we as November comes upon us again, we're seeing all this. Uh, 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 I think a very more. Um, you know, the last last go round, they said the the worst of two evils. So I I think they've anted up the 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 bet on that one because now that's really really how they expect to get the vote, even to the point where. Joe Biden doesn't have to do anything but be breathing and he can go on he can go on black radio and tell people that they're not black if they don't vote for him you know so this is this is the antics that we'll put up with all the way through November and I bet none of these candidates or people that support them will be able to even run with this concept here to really even give it some serious consideration because it, 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 it would touch them. It would shake them at the very core of their own system that they would have to take some other things into consideration, but it's a discussion worth having. So. Thanks Ross. Uh, Jabbar is up next. Yeah, no, I was um, going to say, yeah, they did. I mean, they're gonna keep beating you, keep doing what they want you to do, and not you do nothing about it, just to keep it, just to keep it going. And about the voting thing, yeah, I mean, shoot, I I, I agree. It's like the Democratic Party and the and the Republican Party, they're basically two wings of the same party, the left and the right wing of the same capitalist party. So, I mean. Because I heard, even heard some prominent Democrats saying that they're going to vote for Donald Trump if uh, if uh, Bernie Sanders turned out to be the nominee. 
So it was like, whoa, that that just shows you what what they're talking about, you know, what their what their priorities are at. So they don't, you know, they don't they care about the money, and as long as that keeps coming in, then it's all good. But yeah, when you start messing stuff up, when you start tearing stuff up, and you just say, oh man, don't don't hit me again, and they'll hit you again. As soon as you fight back, they'll start thinking twice. And uh, Sarah? Um, yeah, in, in terms of like, to be peaceful in the face of like horrific violence, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, being like, repeti repeti just being told over and over again uh, about peaceful protesting. Um, that's like one thing that comes to my mind. Uh, I, I totally agree. It should not, uh, setting cop cars on fire is just beautiful. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, cause I don't know. It's like if, if, if a society or if a person as an analogy, like eats a dog over and over again, and then like the dog, you know, bites back or whatever in self-defense and then they get mad at, at you know, whatever, or, or a person beats another person. And then they get mad when the person, you know, stands up for themselves and is like, oh, no, 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 you're supposed to be peaceful here. Like, you're supposed to, like, take this, this violence and, and, and be okay with it. Um, yeah, so in, in those regards, uh, laws, you know, about, I don't know, just, yeah, they do ask us to be peaceful. <laughs> and in the chat, Nicolette says, it's like an abusive relationship, the abusee oftentimes becomes part of the cycle of abuse and defends the abuser through manipulation and psychological tactics. And Tess says, yes, psychological violence. Carrie says, here, here. Uh, Leather Griffin, uh, can I say your name, your, your actual name, Leather? Is that okay, or should I keep it at, at that? <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> it's Kingsley. <laughs> Kingsley's part of our Black Studies group. <laughs> says, I agree, Ross. And um, yeah, and, and then Tess wrote she had to head out. Uh, just a time check. It is uh, nine twenty-five. We have two more paragraphs. Is it okay if we continue on? I mean, obviously, everyone who can who needs to leave can head out. Um, but uh, let's want to maybe move on to the next paragraph, unless anyone has something about this one. Uh, volunteer to read. Kingsley, are you in a place where you can read right now, all right? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I totally put you on the spot. It's all good. I'll read this one. <laughs> it's nice to hear your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm on, um... I'm on like standby and stuff with the kids. They got two little puppies right now too. So I've got a lot, a lot going on, but no, I'll read it. Mr. Floyd's brother lamented. I just don't understand what more we've got to go through in life, man. People are in the streets today because years ago we marched peacefully and belted Negro spirit spirituals, hoping they would recognize our humanity. We wore Afros like crowns, remembering our beauty. We put our fists in the air, demonstrating our strength. We declare that our lives matter in every gorgeous dimension, demanding they stop killing us in the streets and in our homes with impunity. People are in the streets today because despite all the people who lost their lives, literally and figuratively, in this fight for black life, the struggle continues. Thank you. Any thoughts on here? I think the interesting part here is that she says that, that we marched peacefully and sang Negro spirituals, you know, and, and that, that shows me two things. One, I heard Kwame Toure say something about 
that period that taught him something. And it wasn't the peaceful marching, it was to be able to march without fear. And he said that the next go around, people have already shown that they, they can march peacefully and not be afraid. Just imagine how they can march and be able to defend themselves and not be afraid. So I, I see, I see kind of like an evolution of of that, as well as with the cross section of people that kind of stood up and came out with the Black Lives Movement, because the '60s was was pretty, I would say, monocultured for for the most part, especially with the Civil Rights Movement. Now you talk about Vietnam War protests and stuff like that; they probably were a little bit more diverse, but the Civil Rights Movement, I don't think was as diverse and, and now we're seeing a cross sect of society that's involved. And so I think that is showing that people are kind of waking up, you know, and starting to stand up a bit. So they, I think they're watch, wiping the coal out their eyes as they would say. And so I, I see an evolution in that respect. So like this is like a tried a tactic and saw it didn't work, so try something else. So it's part of this longer struggle. Yeah, it's part of a longer struggle, but I, I think because of people who who do have some historical, you know, some some memory of, of the sixties. Because you're always gonna have that 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 church element and people, especially, you know, black folks who are predominantly Christian in this country, they're, they're gonna want to take the path of least resistance and sing, sing the church songs and stuff like that. But then there, there are other people who say, okay, we've done that. Don't mean, don't mean that marching is old and passe because people know you have to get to moving and get in the streets. But as far as just, you know, gonna lock arms and sing Negro spirituals and let them sick the dogs on you. It's a different day and age, man. I watched I watched that Latino woman punch that lady in the face in Arizona. It's a different day and age. You're not just gonna walk up on people and start talking wild. So that's something that they're gonna have to deal with as well. So I'm, I'm seeing, you know, that, and I don't know if the tensions are higher or people are more frustrated or more educated. I think We'll see, but with this energy that we do have, it can be harnessed to house and advance, you know, some real movement. So that's what I've seen from these past the past few weeks. Thank you, Ross. Any other thoughts? Yeah, um, I want to say something real quick. Uh, Sometimes it takes me a while to kind of register everything and then I to like really come out and like say something, whatever. Cause if not, I start going all over the place. But I wanted to say something in regards to the like desensitizing thing with, um, and uh, sometimes I wonder if like, if, if the whole being desensitized is something that deals with capitalism in terms of like how um, people in general, whether it be black, white, whatever, are just fed information and things, whether it be through social media, TV or whatever. And then when like these major networks uh, get these hot topics like on black lives and uh, police brutality and whatever, and, and not even um, bringing the, the, the term anti-blackness to the forefront, just the, the, hot, the hot words like racism or, you know, whatever. I sometimes I wonder if us everyday folks sometimes when we talk when we feel like it's it's desensitizing us, but it's rather like the capitalism um is kind of shading over everything that really is like the the nitty gritty of things. Like so when we're on social media or getting information at times, we're kinda you know, like the people in general will ride the wave for a while and then after a while it kinda goes, Okay, well what else is new? Because then it goes back into you know, working, making money, and uh, trying to achieve whatever a capitalism has to offer to, to folks. And I wonder if that kind of distorts us and kind of keeps us, like, going into, like, this the circle all over again. I don't know. 
but that's uh, and it, and it comes off maybe as like we're being desensitized, but it's really like we're being way more like distracted or something or, or just yeah. you know. I don't, you know, when when you say the desensitized, I don't, I don't know if we are really desensitized, you know, because I think when when you're watching these things like this, it's not normal, and so we're we're still trying to be normal during abnormal situations. But what do we do? We escape, mm -hmm. you know. We start we start using more of whatever we use, and we want to start using designer drugs and drinking cough syrup. Mm -hmm. playing video games all day. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's there's a point where we're just trying to escape because when you see all this stuff around you, you know, I don't I don't think it does really desensitize you. I I think it trains us more to want to escape in some in some respects. You know, right. because when you look at some of the things that are going on, it's like, man, we we you know we use it so much drugs now, we don't even call people drug addicts. We just say you self-medicating, you know, because a lot of people are using a little bit of everything nowadays. And I think that mm -hmm. is symptomatic of what's going on. You know, not just the violence, man, but the the the, the soft war on us. You know, look how mm -hmm. families are being broken up by capitalism. You know, you, right. got, you got two parents in the house and they, they can't work enough to get stuff going. Yeah. And so they, you know, they come home and maybe irritated or whatever, and start drinking on whatnot and smoking on whatnot. As people are trying to ease themselves, so I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't really say we're, you know, get getting desensitized. I would say, I, I would say distracted and trying to escape. Right. Yeah. You know? And I, I agree with that. And I, and just to piggyback on that, I think that's like what I was saying. Capitalism. That's also how it gets into you know, how it really just saturates everything and kind of makes us look at the issue and it kind of isolates it. It's like, okay, that happened six months ago. I'm on something new now and I'm doing doing this or whatever else, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, the endless murders that's been happening uh, that, that we know that's been on, you know, recorded that we could see, you know, from the Walter Scotts to uh, Tamir Rice to, you know, the names go on and on. The the Philando Castillo, I believe his name was, the one that got killed in Minnesota as well, you know, and his, and his daughter's in the car and all that stuff. It's like these things are are, you know, it's it's disgusting to sit here and 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 and, and take this in. And it's like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't say desensitized, but yeah, just like we're just, we're so distracted though. It's like, you know, these things happen and occur and, and you know, we the people ride the wave and because like like others said earlier you know you got these companies that literally banking in money on this shit you know with whatever merchandise they're making or what are just covering the stories on the networks alone and what and whatnot and even though there's like independent media out there that you know other folks uh, get into they the masses still control like you know the 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 way people's uh minds get persuaded and stuff you know when these things occur because i know there's a there's a a huge disconnect between how i feel about these things and the way my mother feels about these things and you know and we could be we could be feeling hurt by the same exact situation you know but when i talk about anti-blackness they say to like uh certain older folks it doesn't, it, it, it kind of goes in, as, I don't know uh, older folks you guys talk to, but I know some of the folks I know of, it's like, they get into maybe you're getting like too philosophical or you're getting too deep into something and it's like, no, like we're trying to really get to the root of this. You know what I mean? And, and it gets, um, and I don't know if it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's just a weird way because I feel like capitalism has a funny way of just kind of getting into the cracks and crevices of everything and kind of <laughs> distracting everybody's number, like main the main point, like what's going on? Are we talking about human life or we're just going to do this for like three months and go on to the next like, like hot shit that's to talk about, you know? And I, I think that's, that's where I feel like a society, we could focus more on kind of creating the new, the new world and, and, and trying to see, okay, what's, what's that, what is that envision, you know? Cause um, I know too, with, 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 with issues like this, that some folks might even argue and it comes off as if 
we want what white people want and I don't want that. I, I want to just, I want to be, I want to be a human being and whatever that model is to me, that, that's, that's up for me to decide, you know what I mean? And, um, and I just feel that it, as long as I'm not operating to harm others or whatever, then it shouldn't be anybody's business to intrude on who I, on what I feel is a human being, you know, to in, court, in terms of like what I want to do. Like if I want to go out into the mountains and set up shop and, you know, live out on the land, you know, I shouldn't be considered a savage for that or something like that, you know what I mean? Or, or going back to primitive or whatever it is that people like to say, you know, or, um, so yeah, like I said, I want to keep on going, going on about it, but that's just kind of how I feel. Thank you, Kingsley. In the chat, uh, Jordana um, writes intergenerational trauma. Uh, in, in our Black Studies group, uh, the, we read a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome and another book um, in the realm of hungry ghosts that talks about addiction. Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome uh, talks about these traumas that are inherited from generation to generation by black people, even if plantation chattel slavery no longer exists. And uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts talks about addiction as um, a problem of society, of a pain, of pain that society causes. And so then addiction becomes a way to, to um, kind of be distracted or escape in that, that non-revolutionary way of escaping and creating a different world, it's more like to just escape the, the pain and self-medicate, as Ross mentioned. Uh, Christian writes, asking a person to act peacefully in the face of relentless violence is asking that person to behave in a non-human way. Accepting our suffering in silence has become normalized. I think about how Catholicism silences people in my family from voicing their discomforts. Sarah replies, well said, Christian. And Christy writes, yes, at what point after seeing all of this does the capitalistic lifestyle change? It seems as if people will eventually go back to their quote unquote normal functioning. Should we move on to our last paragraph of this essay? And a final volunteer to read. I'll finish it off, if that's cool. Sure. All right. So let's stop saying racism killed George Floyd, or worse yet, that a racist police officer killed George Floyd. George Floyd was killed because anti-Blackness is endemic to and is central to how all of us make sense of the social, economic, historical, and cultural dimensions of human life. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What do we think about that? Let's stop saying racism killed George Floyd, or worse yet, that a racist police officer killed George Floyd. How is that not helpful to, to say racist police officer or racism? <clears throat> well, it puts pressure to make you look at the whole, like deeper into what's going on instead of just, you know, like you said, painting the brush over or just something saying racist, because then that kind of, it allows uh, society to do the whole, a few bad apples type thing, you know, and then try to like weigh in on that. And then, then they, you know, instead of looking at it and saying, well, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole philosophy of, of the police is tainted and, you know, and, and fucked up really. And it, and it, and it needs to be changed in terms of the whole philosophy, the, the, the way, you know, the way they perceive things, you know, going into the me versus them mentality. Um, and, you know, while uh, making things seem like they are the peacemakers, you know, of the world, um, 
so it 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 kind of it really puts puts hold on on society to say hey look um you know stop the bullshit basically and really start looking at this as you know this is anti-blackness this is something that's been going on since the since the the building blocks of this of this nation you know so um i don't know yeah thanks kingsley jafar Lorena, to what you just said, Kingsley in the chat says, right, exclamation point. Uh, Jabbar? Jabbar, you're muted. I don't know if you're speaking. But... Oh, yeah, my bad. I, I'm done. Thank you. No, I was joking. Yeah, I was saying what uh, Kingsley was, you know, I was just going to say what Kingsley said and not to mention, you know, I mean, um, just, you know, the cops and the way they act, but also the way um, their bosses act, the way the DA acts, the way the hospital, the medical examiners act, the way, you know, the, it's basically the, it's a systemic problem. It was built like this. It runs it's a well-oiled machine. The system is not broken. It was built like this. That's basically all I was going to say. Yeah, at protests, we're seeing uh, signs that say the system is broken or maybe people's commentary online that this isn't the America, that, I, that this isn't what America used to be, what has happened to my country. Um, a lot of it, in, in, along those lines, points to Trump as the reason for it, uh, which falls in line with pointing to that specific police officer rather than as an entire structure of society. I wonder if for folks, does this now, now having, we can go back to, um, our slide, this one. Does this now with this structure, uh, uh recognizing the structure, uh, that we are, live in, does it seem overwhelming to resist? Does it seem uh, like it helps make more sense? I'll go to this one probably better because that shows uh, uh, the escape from captivity. Does it feel more overwhelming? Does it feel liberating? Does it feel less confusing? Does it feel more confusing? I wonder what folks thoughts are. I feel it to be liberating to escape. Um, I don't know if that's the question, what, what you asked, but um, I don't know. Did I, is, that, is that what you're asking right there? Well, yeah, the, uh, yeah, is it liberating to, um, my question was more, I mean, I agree with you obviously for this game. My question <laughs> was more like, it, is it like uh, having this understanding now of the big picture of the root, is that, more liberating uh does it feel like hopeful or does it feel overwhelming does it feel like it's just uh too big to fight well i feel i feel like it's empowering info that needs to be relayed to more people mm -hmm. because we need to address it in our communities especially when you see minorities or people of color who don't like other people of color and they don't really have a, a real good reason aside from them being indoctrinated in capitalist hate. And so it gives you that encouragement, that, that bit of knowledge. But then it also makes me wonder, like, because I've, I've heard that you go from capitalism to socialism to, you know, communism or Marxism or whatever. But you know, how does that progression work? You know, when maybe that person is saying it from the aspect or the, the point of, they think there may be peaceful transitions, but history has shown us that it won't be 
a peaceful transition to move from, you know, capitalism to socialism to whatever it is we decide to come up with, right? So, and I think that's just, uh, you know, just limited knowledge because I know there are socialist countries that used to be capitalist countries and how that, how that has worked and how it come, how did it come to be and what were some of the, strugg the struggles and challenges they had to endure for them to make that transition. So it makes me wonder that as well. So it, it makes me think that we need to educate people in our community better, but then it also makes me think on, you know, structural changes that need to happen because when people say, oh, this isn't the America that, you know, it used to be or the one that, it, that it's supposed to be, and I'm thinking in like, I'm pretty sure a majority of people who are here are like, no, it's the one that they made it to be. It's working just fine, you know. So, I don't know. So, but it's it's good info. You know, speaking of the that um, transition from capitalism, socialism, communism that we hear a lot from many leftist Marxist movements, uh, we talked a lot about capitalism here. We uh, we said the we said the word. We didn't talk too much about the like the specifics of how it functions, and there's a lot to be said about that that we also talk about in our Black Studies group and, and other reading groups are across town. Um, uh, we had a uh, the first reading group we had was actually to read uh, Karl Marx's Volume One of Cap the Critique of Capital, uh, in se several sections, and there's a relationship there with. Uh, if you look up at whiteness and blackness, but more like if you think of it, like of course the human and the non-human, which are, they're marked together. Whiteness is human, blackness as non-human. Uh, to be a waged worker uh, means that even though you don't have anything, they've taken your land, they've kicked you off the land, and now they've forced you to be a worker that earns a wage so that you can buy the things that you need in order to just live, like water, food, housing, everything, you have to buy it. Whereas before, or in non-capitalist societies, you don't have to buy those things. Um, it, when you're a waged worker, you don't own anything except for your labor power. So you are a property owner in that way. And what a lot of movements on the left, especially Marxist movements have missed is that they think that the big, you know, they talk about the big struggle is the worker versus the capitalist, the boss, or the owner of what they call the means of production, like the factory, for example. What they miss is that black people, if they're in this position of the structural position of slaveness, the slave does not own anything, definitely not their labor power. The slave is like how the article talked about the, th the thingification of black people. They're an object that somebody else owns, that the master owns. They, they can't even engage in a negotiation over conditions of work or wage. They don't have those rights even that, that the worker has. So there is a massive difference between those, uh, the worker and the slave. And that's not something that a lot of leftist movements have talked about in, the, in, in talking about capitalism. So I wanna highlight that because again, like I really think the black radical tradition, uh, like at least me personally, but I'm not the only one. Um, it is one of these schools of thought that is one of the most sophisticated schools of thought together with uh, the other school of thought would be indigenous studies. Uh, indigenous studies also has a massive critique of the world. Uh, and so I really recommend folks uh, look at um, uh, when we're talking about capitalism, look at it from the critique of, of the black of black radical thought and look at, at it from the critique of indigenous radical thought too because you'll see things there that you don't get in a lot of more dominant critiques of capital 
I just wanted to um, to talk about that. And the other the thing that also with this slide, and Lisette, you actually had asked how I have changed this since the, since when you saw me give the presentation. I've uh, that blue line right there, the between whiteness and blackness. I've always talked about how that line is the police. And this is what the problem with police is, not police brutality, but the police is the problem. The police police that division to keep everybody in their place. I would add now the police are also, or, or any other violent kind of entity, um, the court, anything, uh, these violent institutions are also that red circle that prevent the escape out into the creation of another world. So there's this, this entire structure, both internally and externally, is built off of violence, even if it doesn't want to call itself that. And one other thing that I would add, um, that I usually add, but I didn't add here, is that um, that outside what this what this structure does is it try it imposes itself to make us believe that it's the only way i did mention that a little bit earlier imposes itself to think that it's the only way so escaping is a massive threat because then it could have us imagine that we could actually live differently and that's why it tries to erase it's it had to genocide it tried to genocide all Native American people. It, it tries to really destroy entire societies, entire worlds, other worlds out of existence, just so that, um, well, for many reasons, and one important one is so that we can't imagine that we could live a different way. Um, and Lorena, Lorena Ortiz um, in the chat says, yes, it needs to be taught. Uh, Nicolette says, I appreciate the term anti-blackness because I use the term white supremacy to describe things, but anti-blackness centers blackness and is more specific. Yeah, to that, I would add that we do talk a lot about white supremacy and it's still a reality. Uh, and if we can think about anti-blackness as its opposite pole, so here at the top, whiteness, white supremacy at the bottom, would be anti-blackness and how they work together as a unity. So rather than just say white supremacy, if we add anti-blackness um, as these two guiding poles uh, of the modern world, it, it, can, it can, I think, better orient us. And uh, Christy writes in the chat, more, much more clarity and liberating. More people need this to help wrap their minds fully around this concept of anti-blackness. -black Jabbar says, word, it works too well. Kingsley, yes, indeed. Uh, Lorena and talked about police separation. Nicolette says, thank you. Jabbar, you have a, an asterisk. Please, please contribute what you'd like. It's on your mind. Oh, no, I was just going to say when, we were talk when everybody was talking about socialism, communism, capitalism. Maybe we should dive um, a little bit uh, at another time, dive deeper into what that means, because um, just talking with people about socialism and communism and capitalism, um, I see that we have different concepts of what it actually is and what it actually means to us, um, to you know, other people out there. So I don't know, maybe we should uh, one day talk about that so you know, we'll get deeper into it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, time check. We're almost at three hours, and I just want to point out, if you were in a university graduate class at, at the PhD level, you would have three-hour seminars like this, but very, very likely you would not have this, this type of conversation that we're having. I think Ross also mentioned that um, even in university, you don't get this conversation. You also don't get the kind of clarity the, like the real life experience, I think that um, everyone here has contributed to. Uh, so I wanna just name the power of being able to have incredibly sophisticated intellectual conversation, thought generation with community uh, in a way that doesn't try to perform that someone is smarter than the other because that happens a lot in the university. The university is completely within 
this structure, unless you have like the exceptional professor and they do exist, but they're very, very rare. Uh, but the university is within this structure of um, I, I, am, I am smart and you are not smart. Again, this logic is really, it just permeates our everyday life and all of our institutions. Uh, and so we try to do something very, very different with, with what, how we do black studies and how we do other studies, radical studies in the community. And so I just want to name that, um, uh, that this is what uh, uh, you wouldn't even get, like Ross said, you wouldn't even get in the university. So um, it's really cool to, to see folks saying that uh, they found this to be really helpful and um, if you have any feedback on anything, um, uh, other topics like how Jabbar just mentioned, a, a conversation on, on capitalism, socialism, since that's also on, on folks' minds quite a bit. Uh, we recorded it. Uh, and just as a final question, how do folks feel if we uh, put this up and share it with folks? It doesn't have our faces. It's just the screen that you see. And, uh, so it would just be the slides. Um, uh, and we're wondering if there are any objections to that. Um, but if there, if there are, please let us know. Uh, please let the, your buddy know who invited you in. And then uh, within Black Studies, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, and so the final stuff on the chat. Um, uh, just thank, thank you, uh, thank you Kiki for facilitating and everyone else for spending time on this tonight. Aaron says thank you, or maybe that's Dave. Adam says there's also the power of patriarchy and respectability politics that plays into the equation. Thank you all. Carrie, I've really gotten a lot from this and I appreciate being included. It's been an honor to be here, thank you. Jordana, thank you everyone for your contributions. Collaboration was beautiful. Ross, to the comment about you won't get this in the university is they won't get tenure. The professors won't get tenure if they talk like this. There are some gems out there that might, uh, but uh, but yeah, in general, this is getting to the, the, the root of things. And then Tim says, thanks everyone for a great conversation. Christian says, thanks all. Sarah says, I'm okay with it. I uh, think about the recording. Uh, Aaron and Dave both are thankful. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I learned so much from the conversation and listening to everyone. And Kingsley will give you the last word as the last asterisk in the comments. Go ahead. All right. I just want to say something real quick. Um, yo, uh, thanks for you know having me here and everything. Um, I don't want to piss nobody off, but for in the future, I feel like, um, and I don't know how other people feel about this, but because um, like I don't, I don't know everybody, and it doesn't matter if I don't know everybody. But I'm just wondering if there's like some people that nobody knows um, or something. Can you like at least tell us like who invited you or something like that? That way we can kind of trace it to who knows what, who's linked to who. Um, that way, there's just not no like ghost people hanging around uh snooping in on stuff i don't know i just have i have a little uh, uh i don't know what the word is but i think about those things from time to time in terms of who's around in within the conversations that we're having but mm -hmm. now that i guess that might come off wrong but if people don't feel about you know no liking to that mm -hmm. i apologize it's just i don't know well, what i can do is i can um <clears throat> i can uh Take a list of folks who are here. I I think that I know almost everybody through other folks, even if I don't know. Um, right. But it is something that we did talk about within um, within uh, our our Black Studies group uh, about opening it up. This is the first time we've opened it up. And again, it's usually just nine of us, and we know each other very very well from years of studying together. <clears throat> and um, we're talking obviously about very. Uh, uh, very radical topics that um, mm. require a lot of um, understanding so that they're not misunderstood. Um, but also they can be very, hopefully, they can be very uh, subversive to the dominant order. That's the whole point. And it is, and it is uh, the case that uh, 
writers, even if they've never held a weapon, artists, uh, even if they've never held a weapon, are still assassinated. For uh, the word can also be a weapon. And so thanks to everybody for being here uh, and uh, we'll check in with, with everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Word. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Take it easy, you guys. Thank you. All right, have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Hey.